Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's not Sabbath here yet, but it will be eventually. And uh, thank you all for coming to the study. Continuing A.T. Jones, the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And uh, the last one was very interesting. Um, but before, before we begin the study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, um, for the work that you've been doing in our lives for this past week, the challenges that we have faced. And so we come before you to experience uh, your presence on the Sabbath. We ask, Lord, that we can behold Christ. We can see the light that shines from the cross, what it means that Christ has taken upon himself our nature and that he wants to live his righteousness in us. We pray for each person, for the personal needs and, and uh, struggles, for the trials that they face. We pray for those who are watching live or those who watch later. We ask, Lord, that you can bless them. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, good evening again, everyone. So, this study is just a quick review. We know that the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, that A.T. Jones presented the idea that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down. And now, in 1895, he believes that they're in the time of the loud cry and that his history, what he doesn't know is that his history is prefiguring or typical of our line of our time. Um, he's in a line that's going to um, not result in the second coming of Christ. And in some ways we are also in a line that's similar that is, we are in a repeat of history or in a typical history as well. And our history is typifying what's going to happen very soon. So it's in the repeat of the first and second angels' messages. And Jones has some understanding of this, um, but not to the depth that we have here at the end of the world. Now, his main focus here is upon um, the third angel's message. But first, he starts with uh, really showing the condition of the Christian churches. And then he has worked his way to understanding the truths of the gospel in contrast to the world. So the third angel's message is in the context of the Sunday law, of the mark of the beast. And he's showing clearly that the gospel is unlike anything that the world has to offer. So we're going to begin reading this and go through. We're, we'll take about an hour, I think. I, I try not to go too late. Uh, we have Stephen with us from Ireland, and he's suffering a bit from jet lag. And uh, so we don't want to go too long. But uh, we ask for your prayers for the plans that we have for this week ahead, preparing for the camp meeting. Stephen and I will be preparing notes and doing some plans about our presentations as well as trying to sort out some things that we've been studying. So anyway, we're going to begin reading A.T. Jones, uh, the third angel's message, number 15. We are still studying the name of Christ, which is God with us. And as stated before, he could not be God with us without becoming ourselves, because it is not himself. It is not himself that is manifest in the world. We do not see Jesus in this world as he was in heaven. He did not come into this world as he was in heaven, nor was that personality manifested in the world, which was in heaven before he came. He emptied himself and became ourselves. Then putting his trust in God, God dwelt with him. And he being ourselves and God being with him, he is God with us. That is his name. So one of the things Joan had, Jones had shown in the other one is that often when we think of God with us, we just think of God coming and being among us. 
but he shows that God is us, right? So this, this idea um, he's going to expand upon, and it's really a part of an understanding of the nature of Christ. If he had come into the world as he was in heaven, being God, manifesting himself as he was there, and God being with him, his name would not have been God with us, for he would not then have been ourselves. But he emptied himself. He himself was not manifested in the world, for it is written, no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Not simply no man, but no one. No one knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. It is not written, no man knoweth the Son, but the Father, and he to whom the Father will reveal him. No, no man knoweth the Son at all, but the Father. And the Father, Father does not reveal the Son in the world, but the Son reveals the Father. Christ is not the revelation of himself. He is the revelation of the Father to the world and in the world and to men. Therefore, he says, no man knoweth the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal the Father. So it is the Father that is revealed in the world and revealed to us and revealed in us in Christ. This is the one thing that we are studying all the time. This is the center around which everything else circles. And Christ having taken our human nature in all things in the flesh, and so having become ourselves, when we read of him and the Father's dealings with him, we are reading of ourselves and of the Father's dealings with us. What God did to him was to us. What God did for him was for us. And therefore, again, it is written, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That is, he didn't know sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 In all points, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. And he is our brother in the nearest blood relationship. We are now to study another phase of this great subject. First, in the Psalms, Christ in the Psalms, that we may see how entirely the Psalms mean Christ and that the one whose experience is recorded there is Christ. It is impossible to touch the whole 150 Psalms in detail in one lesson or in a dozen lessons, yet in a sense we can touch the whole 150 by so touching a few as to show the one great secret of the whole number, and that secret is Christ. We shall take some of the Psalms of which God himself has made the application to Christ so that there can be no possible doubt the Psalm refers to Christ. And then when we read these Psalms, we know that we are reading of Jesus Christ and of God's dealings with him. He too, being ourselves all the time, weak as we are, sinful as we are in the flesh, made to be sinners just as we are, all our guilt and our sins being laid upon him, and he, feeling the guilt and the condemnation of it in all things as ourselves. Take the 40th Psalm, which refers to Christ at his coming into the world. Turn to the 40th Psalm and the 10th of Hebrews, both at once, beginning with Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. The margin reads, mine ears hast thou digged. The secret of the reference there is to that passage in the 21st chapter of Exodus 1 to 6, where if a man be a Hebrew servant, he shall serve his master a certain number of years, and the year of release he shall go out free. But if he say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then the master shall bring him to the doorpost and bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his servant forever. That hole bored through his ears with an awl was an outward sign that that man's ears were always opened to the word of the master, ready to obey. 
Now, as Christ came into the world as a man, he said to the Father, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Mine ears are open to thy word, ready for thy commands, and I will not go out. I love my master and my children. I will not go out. I am thy servant forever. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that me that he may establish the second. So that parts from uh, Hebrews chapter 10. So Jones goes on. There is the Lord's application of the 40th Psalm to Christ. And he said this when he came into the world. Let us read on then in the 40th Psalm. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy laws within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Who? Christ. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Who? Christ. Where did he get iniquity? Oh, the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Were they not more than the hairs of his head? And when he would look at himself and consider himself, where would he appear in his own sight? Oh, my heart faileth me because of the enormity of the guilt and the condemnation of sin, our sins that were laid upon him. But in his divine faith and trust in the Father, he continues, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that, will, that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that they say unto me, aha, aha. Didn't they say that to him on the cross? Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Who said so? He who was conscious of iniquities in such number that they were more than the hairs of his head. He who was so bowed down and so burdened with these, he was praising and rejoicing in the Lord. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. Now turn to the first verse of the 40th Psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Who? Christ. And he was ourselves. Shall we then say the word, I waited patiently for the Lord, um, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry? Assuredly. What laden with sin what? Laden with sin as I am, sinner as I am, sinful flesh as I have. How do I know that he hears my cry? Ah, he has demonstrated it for a whole lifetime in my nearest of kin. He has demonstrated it in my flesh that he inclines, leans over to listen to my cry. Well, there are times, you know, when our sin, sins seem to be so mountain high. We are so discouraged by them 
And Satan is right there ready to say, yes, you ought to be discouraged by them. There's no use of your praying to the Lord. He will not have anything to do with such as you are. Uh, you are too bad. And we begin to think that the Lord will not hear our prayers at all. Away with such thoughts. Not only will he hear, but he is listening to hear. Remember the statement in Malachi, the Lord hearkened and heard. To hearken is to listen. Then the Lord is listening to hear the prayers of people laden with sin. But there are times in our discouragement when the waters go over our souls, when we can hardly muster up the courage of faith to speak our prayers aloud. Oh, at such times as that, if they are too faint in our faith, if, if they are too faint in our faith to reach him as he listens, then he leans over and listens. He inclines his ear and hears. That is the Lord. That is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the lover and savior of sinners. Then if he should lead you and me through the deep waters and they go over our souls as they did over his, oh, we can wait patiently for the Lord. He will incline unto us. He will lean over and hear our cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my going, goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And he shall see it, see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Who said so? Jesus. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Now turn to the 22nd Psalm. There's so much in that that is familiar to everybody that all know where it applies. First verse, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who said so? Jesus on the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. He came in the line of the fathers. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. And they trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man and despised of the people. All that, that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. You know, that is the record of his crucifixion. This is the crucifixion psalm. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when, as, when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as, mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. John says, here is the experience on the cross. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling. That is, the margin says, my only one. Uh, the Septuagint says, my only begotten from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye, the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, 
But when he cried unto him, he heard. Who says so? Who says that from the cry of the afflicted one, from the sinner who is burdened and laden with sin, more than the hairs of his head? Who says that God the Father will not turn away from such a one? Christ says so. And he knows it. Who says that the Father will not hide his face from such as I and such as you? Christ says so. And he has demonstrated it. For is he not now alive and in glory at the right hand of God? And in that, it is demonstrated before the universe that God will not hide his face from the man whose iniquities are gone over his head and are more than the hairs of his head. Then be of good cheer, be of good courage. He is our salvation. He has wrought it out. He has demonstrated to all men that God is savior of sinner. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Who will? Now note, who was he when he was saying this? He was ourselves. Then who shall it be that is saying it still? Will it not count now for us in him, as well as it did 1,800 years ago for us in him? He counted for us then in him because he was ourselves. And now in him, is it not the same thing? Now the last two verses of the 22nd Psalm. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. And he hath done this. The 23rd Psalm comes next after the 22nd. The Lord is my shepherd. Whose? Christ's. The 22nd is the crucifixion hymn, the crucifixion psalm. Where is the 23rd then? Let us see. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Who? Me, a sinner? One laden with sins, will he lead me in the paths of righteousness? Yes. How do you know? He did it once. In Christ, he led me in the paths of righteousness once. For his name's sake, a whole lifetime. Therefore, I know that in Christ, he will lead me, a sinful man, again and ever in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That is faith. Taking these words, as we have heard in Brother Prescott's lesson this evening, as being themselves the salvation of God, which comes to us, they themselves will work in us the salvation of God itself. That is, where Christ got it. When he put himself where we are, where did he get salvation? He did not save himself. That was the taunt. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe on him. He, he could have done it. But if he had saved himself, it would have ruined us. We would have been lost if he had saved himself. Oh, but he saves us. Then what saved him? This word of salvation saved him when he was ourselves. And it saves us when we are in him. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Me, me, and this in order that everyone on the earth can say in him, he leadeth me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Where was he in the 22nd Psalm on the cross facing death? The 23rd Psalm comes right in there in proper order, you see, as he steps into the dark valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Who? Christ. And in him, ourselves. And we know it because God did it once for us in him, and in him it is done still for us. Thou preparedest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Who? Me. Thank the Lord. How do I know? Because they did it. 
they did follow me once in him. Goodness and mercy did follow me from birth unto the grave once in this world in him. And as long as I am in him, they follow me still. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How do I know? Ah, because that in him, it has been done once for me. It has been demonstrated before the universe that it is so, and I will take it and am glad. <clears throat> and then the 24th Psalm comes right on after the 23rd. The 22nd is the crucifixion psalm. The 23rd takes him through the valley of the shadow of death. And the 24th is the ascension psalm. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting lasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. He did it once for me in him. In him it is done still for me. And in him I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is all only illustrative of the truth as to Christ in the Psalms. Look at the 69th Psalm, and we shall see this further. Indeed, where can we look in the Psalms without seeing it? That is the question. Where in the Psalms can we look and not see it? I will read a verse or two in the 69th Psalm, though you may see that this is exactly applicable there. Fourth verse, they that hate me without cause are more than the hairs of mine head. The scripture was fulfilled. They hate me without cause. You remember seventh verse, for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And his disciples remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Paul writes in Romans 15, 3, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Now, Psalm 69, 20 and 21 reproach hath broken my heart and I'm full of heaviness and I looked for some to take pity but there was none and for comforters but I found none they gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink then that psalm applies to Christ look at the first verse save me O God for the waters are come in unto my soul I sink in the deep mire where there is no standing I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Then follows, they that hate me without cause, etc. Then the fifth verse, O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee. Whose sins? Christ's, the righteous one, who knew no sin, made to bear sin for us. Our sins were upon him. The guilt and condemnation of these were not hid from God. <clears throat> now, I haven't really commented much here because Jones is so straightforward in his approach of looking at these verses. But this idea that the Psalms represent the experience of Christ as he is in humanity Um we know that David wrote many of these psalms, and David was a man after God's own heart. David, in a sense, is writing of his own experience, but he's also speaking of Christ. He's not just speaking of himself. He's writing prophetically, and, and we should be able to see that. So Jones goes on, um, oh, it was a terrible thing that he should undo himself and become ourselves in all things in order that we might be saved, running the risk, the fearful risk of losing all, risking all to save all. But what were we of ourselves from head to foot? Nothing but a body of sin. Yet he risked all to save us. It is true. But we were nothing true. But in his love and in his pity, he did it. Thank the Lord that he had the royal courage to do it 
and he won and he won it and we are saved in him we read here his confession of sin this was he as ourselves in our place confessing our sins and we needed that also he was baptized in our behalf because no baptism on our part could be perfect so as to be accepted in righteousness it must be perfect to be accepted no man's confession of sin can itself ever be so perfect as to be accepted of god in righteousness because man is imperfect but it must be perfect to be accepted where then shall perfection of confession be found ah in him my confession of sin is perfect for he made the confession how many times when persons have made confession as thoroughly as they know how satan gets the advantage of them by the suggestion you have not properly confessed your sin you have not confessed hard enough to get forgiveness oh of course you have confessed but you have not done it hard enough god cannot forgive you on such a confession as that hold the word of god up before him and tell him there is one who is perfect he bore my sins and he has made the confession and when he shows me the sin i confess it according to my power and ability and as god reveals it to me and in him and by virtue of his confession mine is accepted in righteousness his confession is perfect in every respect and god accepts mine in him now this this idea here sometimes has been distorted ellen white presents a a similar idea and i'm going to try to find uh, the passage here in the spirit of prophecy now um i think i know the words so i should be able to find it fairly quickly um i think uh yes so this is a statement um this is in the youth instructor april 16th 1903 and this is talking about prayer so i i had a pastor read this to me early on in my adventist experience it was the pastor who baptized me as an example of why we can never be we never overcome sin um but if we take what Jones has has said here and we look at this passage uh so the youth instructor April 16th 1903 it's actually the last we look at the last two paragraphs and as Christ intercedes for us the spirit worketh upon our hearts drawing forth prayer and penitence praise and thanksgiving the gratitude which flows from human lips is the result of the spirit striking the chords of the soul awakening holy music the prayer and praise and confession of god's people ascends as sacrifices to the heavenly sanctuary but they ascend not in spot spotless purity passing through the corrupt channels of humanity they are so defiled that unless purified by the righteousness of the great high priest they are not acceptable by god Christ gathers into the censer the prayers the praise and the sacrifices of his people and with these he puts the merits of his spotless righteousness then perfumed with the incense of Christ propitiation our prayers holy and entirely acceptable rise before god and gracious answers are returned so what people argue from this is that we'll see our our prayers are corrupt and Christ has to purify those and they make the same argument about our sins that what we basically do is we do our best and God does the rest that's what they're saying but you can see how this is completely incompatible with what Jones has presented because is this what Jones has presented has Jones presented the idea that we do our best and Christ does the rest is that what is happening is that is that the what he's trying to say 
but we can see that that can't possibly be compatible, right? Now, can anybody say why it's not compatible? What's the difference? Because our best is filthy rigs. Okay, but so so people can say we just do our best. It's filthy rags, and Christ takes His garment of righteousness and covers our filthy rags. And so even though we continue to sin until Jesus comes back, it's not our righteousness; it's Christ's righteousness. So, you know, God just sort of pretends that we are righteous, and and that's how we get into heaven. Even though we're not righteous, he, he looks at Christ. Now, there's a partial truth there, but what is the difference? What is the difference between what Jones is saying and what Ellen White is saying? Those two things are the same. But between how people interpret what Ellen White is saying, because what they're saying is we do our best, God does the rest, and they're taking what Ellen White says about prayer and trying to apply it to the whole Christian life. But if we understand what Jones is saying, we can understand what Sister White is saying. So what is Jones saying? Is he saying that when we confess our sins, it's imperfect? And so we just did our best, but Jesus is going to make up for it? Is that what he did when he took upon humanity? Was it just a, a, a posturing? Or was it real? That is, did Christ actually overcome sin in the flesh? And is he actually offering to us the overcoming of sin in the flesh? Or is he just offering as a substitute his overcoming of sin in the flesh for our failure to overcome sin in the flesh? So these, these, are, the, these are the twistings that end up happening. Jeff, you have a comment? Well, he gives us the gives us the power to overcome. Right. Because he had the power to overcome, right? Yeah. So if he just simply did it for us and we didn't overcome, we don't overcome, we don't experience his power, then it's merely just a a posturing. It's a it's just a, a play. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really happen. But Jones is quite clear that there's actually something that happens to us. So when it, Ellen White's talking about our prayers, first off, she's talking about uh, what Christ has to do uh, uh, in, in taking a sinner who can't really truly confess his sins. He can't truly um, represent Christ because he's a sinner. But when Christ takes passing through the corrupt channels of humanity. Did Jesus have the corrupt channels of humanity in and of himself? Yes. Right. So it's showing that this is something that's real and actual, not something that's pretend. And possible. And impossible, because Christ showed that it was possible. And he offers that to us. But we know that we're imperfect, but we have to come to God. And so God is going to have to do this for us and in us. And he did that by becoming us. If he hadn't become us, we wouldn't be able to overcome sin. And if we can't overcome sin, we can't enter into God's kingdom. So not just not just for us, but in us. But in us, this, yes. This is kind of related to what Ellen White says when she says that... Um... Humanity, con, com, humanity combined with divinity does not sin. Yes, that which does cannot commit it? sin. Yeah. Humanity and divinity combined cannot commit sin or do not commit sin. Yes, that's exactly what she's talking yeah. about. So we know we're sinners and our role and responsibilities we've talked about is to see ourselves as sinners. Right. Christ in taking upon himself humanity sees himself as a sinner. He feels as a sinner. He feels our guilt. And he exercises righteousness by faith and demonstrates that in spite of the fact that we are sinners, we can trust in God's righteousness. Christ trusts not in his own righteousness, but in his Father's righteousness. 
And we don't trust in our righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ, because Christ has obtained that righteousness by faith for us so we can experience his righteousness and the righteousness of the Father, just as he did. But it's only through Christ. We couldn't go to the Father ourselves. So what we see here in this passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by the righteousness of the great high priest, Christ is our great high priest. In the book of Hebrews, Paul clearly shows that in order to be our high priest, he has to be completely God and completely man. He has to bridge that gap between humanity and divinity. So this idea that people take where they take Ellen White's statement and they just say, well, all, all of us are corrupt and Christ does this for us. What they don't really understand is he did that by taking upon himself our nature in its fallen condition, something they're not willing to accept. So the whole means, the whole way in which salvation comes to humanity, they reject Christ as the Messiah, as the sacrificial lamb. And yet they're Seventh-day Adventist ministers who do this. But of course, many people buy into this. They hear the lie, but they believe the lie. And that is a choice that they have made. So hopefully that what Jones is saying doesn't get twisted because people will take Ellen White's statement, twist it. They'll take Jones and twist it. He just did it all for us. But we know that he didn't just do it all for us. He did it all in us. Right. That that is a huge difference. Right. That's a big difference. <laughs> Okay, then in him, we have exemption from Satan's discouragement as to whether we have confessed our sins hard enough. And this would apply even to the fact that we see ourselves as sinners. Satan comes and says, you're a sinner. Christ, Satan came to Christ and said, you're a sinner. You know, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right? He trusted in what his father had said 40 days before. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Christ didn't trust in what he saw in himself being our sin bearer. He trusted in what his father said in spite of what he saw. And that's righteousness by faith. So. So then in him, we have exemption from Satan's discouragement as to whether we have confessed our sins hard enough sought them out faithfully enough or repented enough. In Christ, we have repentance. In him, we have confession. In him, we have perfection. And in him, we are complete. Oh, he is the Savior. Weak as we are, sinful as we, simply ourselves. He went through this world and never sinned. He was as sinful as we, weak as we, helpless as we, helpless as the man who is who is without God, yet by his trust in God, God so visited him, so abode with him, so strengthened him, that instead of sin ever being manifested, the righteousness of God was always manifested. But who was he? He was ourselves. Then God has demonstrated once in the world and to the universe that he will so come to me and you and so live with us as we are in the world today and will cause his grace and his power to so abide with us that in spite of all of our sinfulness, in spite of all of our weakness, the righteousness and the holy influence of God will be manifested to men instead of ourselves and our sinfulness. The mystery of God is not God manifest in sinful, sinless flesh. There is a mystery about God being manifest in sinless flesh. That is natural. There, there, um, there is a mystery about God being manifest in sinful flesh. That is natural enough. Um, or sinless flesh. It should be there is no mystery about God being manifest in sinless flesh. That is natural enough. Is not God himself sinless? Is there then any room for wonder? that God could manifest himself 
through or in sinless flesh? Is there any mystery as to God's manifesting his power and his righteousness, righteous glory through Gabriel or through the bright seraphim or the cherubim? No, that is natural enough. But the wonder is that God can do that through and in sinful flesh. That is the mystery of God. God manifest in sinful flesh. In Jesus Christ, as he was in sinful flesh, God has demonstrated before the universe that he can so take possession of sinful, sinful flesh as to manifest his own presence, his power, and his glory, instead of sin manifesting itself. And all that the Son asks of any man in order to accomplish this in him is that the man will let the Lord have him as the Lord did Jesus. Jesus said, I will put my trust in him. And in that trust, Christ brought to everyone the divine faith by which we can put our trust in him. And then we do separate, so separate from the world and from our own, from our soul trust in him. Then God will so take us and so use us that our sinful selves shall not appear to influence. God will manifest his righteous self, his glory before men, in spite of all ourselves and our sinfulness. That is the truth. And that is the mystery of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory, God manifest in sinful flesh. Upon this point, also, Satan discourages many. To the believing sinner, Satan says, you are too sinful to count yourself a Christian. You cannot have anything to do with you. Look at yourself. You know you are good for nothing. Satan has discouraged us thousands of times with that kind of argument. But God has wrought out an argument that puts this plea of Satan all to shame. For Jesus came and became ourselves, <clears throat> sinful as we are, laden with the sins of the world, far more sins than there are upon me. And in him, laden with 10,000 times more sins than ever were upon me, God has demonstrated that with one so sinful as that, he will come and live a whole lifetime and manifest himself and his righteousness in spite of all the sinfulness, in spite of the devil. God laid help upon one who is mighty, and that help reaches us, thank the Lord. Brethren, that does me good, for I know that if ever anything good is to be manifested in this world where I am, it must come from some source besides myself. That is settled. But oh, the blessedness of it. God has demonstrated that he will manifest his righteous self instead of my sinful self when I let him have me. I cannot manifest righteousness of myself. I cannot manifest his righteousness in myself. No, I let him have me absolutely, overwhelmingly. Then he attends to that. He has demonstrated it so. He has demonstrated a whole lifetime what God is when he is joined with me in sinful flesh. He can do it again, as certainly as he can have me. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to point out, and that you see in what Jones is presenting. Now, so often when it comes to the problem of sin, what people, preachers, <clears throat> people who study the Bible, Christians, are concerned about is getting saved. That is, they want to be saved from the consequences of their sins. But we can see here that what Jesus is doing is not just saving us from the consequences of our sins, but saving us from, from sin itself. That is, the goal of the gospel is not just to make it so that we don't burn in hell forever. The goal of the gospel is to restore the image of God in man. Yeah, Jeff? Just say save saves from the action action of sin, right? So sort of act, acting it out. So I remember when I was a young Christian, um, that a lot of Christians who I talked to, they were always saying, you know, I would talk to them about the Bible and you know the problems I'm having in my life with sin, and they would say, well, don't worry about it, just say the sinner's prayer, and you know. 
as long as you confess Jesus, you will be saved. But I said, I'm not really concerned about being saved from hell. I'm actually being concerned about being saved from the actions of sin. That is, I don't want to continue sinning. I don't want to continue doing things that are going to hurt those around me. And that, all, that, and that hurt me, right? I want to be saved from my sins, not from the consequence of sins. And many Christians did not understand what I was talking about. They weren't interested, this before I was an Adventist, but I thought Adventists would understand this, but they didn't seem to be much different. People just are interested in not suffering the consequences of the sin, and that they think is what salvation is about. And so when you hear about all this stuff like substitutionary atonement or forensic justification or things like this, what people are often are trying to do is to see how can we be saved from from this earth so that we can get into heaven. But the, with somebody who's not saved from their sins, who still wants to do sin, wouldn't they not want to be in heaven? Would they want to be no. in heaven where there is no sin? Then they wouldn't be safe to be in heaven either. Right. So even if you could somehow get them into heaven, but if they're not saved from their sins... They wouldn't want to be in heaven. And of course, they would defile heaven by their sins. Mm -hmm. Because even though we have sinful flesh, we know that that's not what makes us a sinner. Christ had sinful flesh and he wasn't a sinner. Abraham, or not Abraham, Adam had sinless flesh, but he became a sinner. So even having sinless flesh didn't stop him from becoming a sinner. It's the desire. Right. Right. What it is, is it's about the mind. And we're going to see how A.T. Jones addresses that. <clears throat> okay, he goes on. Will you let him have you? Or does it call for, for too full a surrender? No, it is becoming. How full a surrender did he make? He surrendered all himself. Christ gave up himself emptied himself the french translation is he annihilated himself he undid himself he sank himself in us in order that god instead of ourselves and his righteousness instead of our sinfulness might be manifested uh, in us in our sinful flesh then let us respond and sink ourselves in him God may still be manifest in sinful flesh. So using that statement that I that is sometimes used in a jocular way about the man, I use it reverently, and it is a good illustration. It is a right illustration. Who said, I and my wife are one, and I am the one. Christ and the man are one, and the question always is, which shall be the one? Christ has allied himself with every man on the earth. But multitudes say, yes, that is all right enough, but I am the one. Many arrogantly refuse all, exclaiming, I am the one, I am enough. But the Christian, the believer, yielding to Jesus Christ says, yes, thank the Lord. He and I are one, and he is the one. Christ has allied himself with every human being on his own part. And if every human being in the world tonight should drop everything and say, yes, that is a fact. He and I are one and he is the one. Every soul would be saved tonight and Christ would appear in every soul tomorrow. Now, brethren, there's another thing that comes in here in our own practical experience. Christ has allied himself to every human being. Then when he said, in as much as ye have done it or not done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it or not done it unto me. How widespread is that truth? Suppose one comes to my door as a tramp. Suppose he, he be ill-dressed and perhaps not had a good chance to wash himself as clean as he ought to be. Then who is allied to him? Jesus. Who has invested his all in that man? The Lord Jesus. Then as I treat that man, who is affected? The Lord Jesus, to be sure. Shall I treat that man according to the estimate of Christ's investment or according to my opinions as the world looks upon the man? 
That is the question. Suppose here is a man that does not believe in Jesus, a worldly man, a drinking man, a swearing man, and he comes to me in some way, he may come to my door for something to eat or may meet, I may meet him as he is walking by the way. Suppose that out of respect to Christ, I treat that man as Christ's purchase, as the one in whom Christ has invested all. And suppose that man never believes in Jesus at all and dies an infidel and perishes in perdition. How does Christ look upon it, upon that which I did toward the man? In the judgment, if I shall stand on the right hand, he will, will he say anything about that which I did? Oh, he will say, I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. Why, Lord, I know nothing about that. When did I ever see you hungry and feed you, or sick and helped you, or naked and clothed you? I know nothing about this. Oh, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. But suppose a man comes and says, I'm hungry, I would like something to eat, and I respond, what are you drifting around the country for like this, an able-bodied man as you are? Why don't you go get to work? Well, I can't find work. Oh, well, I get plenty of work. I can find work. I have not got out of work yet. I think work is not exactly what you want. I don't have anything for such folks as you are. I do not give him anything, and he goes off. In the day, we shall stand before the throne and find, and I find myself, standing on the left hand, and he says, why, Lord, Lord, I believe on you. Don't you know? I believe the truth. I believed in the third angel's message. Indeed, I was a preacher and preached at the tabernacle in Battle Creek. I did much for the cause in thy name. I did many wonderful things. But the answer is, I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. I wonderingly inquire, when did I ever see you hungry or in need or in sick or sick? I thought you were in heaven, glorified with all your trials past, and I wanted to get up here to see you. I did not suppose you were on earth where I could ever see you hungry or sick. He replies, I came to your door one morning and asked for something to eat after having been almost shelterless through the night. I answer, you? No, I never saw you there. Well, he might point to such and such a time when a man did come to my door in just such a condition as that. But I say, oh, do you mean that man? Surely that was not you. He answers finally, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, you did it unto me. Depart from me. I never knew you. Whether a man gives Christ the credit for what he has invested in him or not, as a believer in Jesus, I must give to Christ the credit for what he has invested in that man. It is not a question whether that man gives him credit for what he has invested in him. It is a question whether those professing to believe in his name will give him credit. And that is where the great lack comes in the profession of Christianity too many times, as well in those who deny him and make no pretension to his name. It is, it is not astonishing that a man who does not believe in Christ at all should give Christ no credit for his investment in him. But here am I, a professor of Jesus. It is astonishing that I should not give Christ the credit for the investment that he has made in that man. In the 58th of Isaiah, the Lord describes the fast that he has chosen. It is that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Who is our own flesh? Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ, as he has allied himself to that man, is my flesh. See that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. This is the fast that the Lord has chosen. Feed the hungry, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow and spread abroad the good of his name and the charity of his goodness everywhere. He has allied himself to human flesh and in doing it to these, we are doing it to him. That is Christianity. <clears throat> So number one, um, what is the center around which everything else circles? In the incarnation, Jesus emptied himself. So I'm not sure what these questions are, where they come in. Um, this looks, it looks like some questions somebody did. Yeah, it's just a yeah. study guide or something. Yeah, like that. study guide ended up being here. Okay, so... 
we can see that if Christ is ourselves, that Christ is in all men, he has done everything for all men, whether that man recognizes it or not. And we need to treat all men as Christ's purchased possession. We need to realize also that we are Christ's purchased possession. Christ needs to be manifest in us. Now, Angela puts here in the notes, dealing with the word uh, um, worm, that that is um, 8439, worm. So that's from Judges 10, verse 1. Cross-reference with Psalms 22, 6, uh, the son of Pua, brilliancy, and Hebrews 1, 3, grandson of Dodo, Hebrew 17, 34, loving. So um, the idea here is that um, one is we're connecting it to this study that we did in Judges, this idea of this worm. Um, so the idea that this self-abasement of Christ. So if Christ abased himself, we are to abase ourselves, right? We are not to lift ourselves up and exalt ourselves. So Christ became a sinner by taking upon man's nature without the least in participating in sin. But as he experienced what it's like to be a sinner without sinning, he emptied himself to take upon himself our humanity, my nature, my sins, so that he could lift me up. But if I exalt myself, he that exalts himself shall be abased, right? So there's there's lots in this. I mean, Jones is um, is going to elaborate on some of this stuff as we go through this, uh, because the next study is going to be on on Isaiah chapter fifty eight. So he's going to elaborate upon this, and that's an extremely powerful chapter. I suggest people read it and see what it actually says. So any final comments before we close with prayer? You misread some Which? of it when you said um, if we do not help other people, we are not helping. If when you do unto others, you do unto Christ. Yeah. If you don't help others, you don't do unto Christ. I read it wrong. You read it as the first. I'm sorry. But Anyway, that's I think just, people probably figured that out. Probably, but I'm just clarifying <laughs> yeah. for those who didn't understand that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, somebody else is just on this Angela again connecting. So we're going to close with prayer. And um, so this Sabbath is, um, you know, the first Sabbath that uh, Stephen's going to be here. And I'm going to bring him to Warburg Church, but I'm also going to bring him, uh, Lord willing, to call in studies. And um, we need to pray for this movement. We ask for prayer uh, for us and what we're doing, because our goal is not to justify self, but to bring others to Christ and to the truth that God has given us. We want others to be saved. And if that means a cross for us, then that's a cross for us. So we ask for your prayers, and, uh, and and especially as we approach the camp meeting, the plans that we have, we know that we need um, God to order events and circumstances. Um, but we also have to a uh, work to do, and it's a lot of labor that we have to have ahead of us. So anyway, let's uh, close with prayer. <clears throat> A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the study this evening, that Christ became us, and that we need to see this in other people, not just people who are poor, but even people who are Christians, people who have many things, that those people need to be ministered to, and that self has to be hid in Christ and that Christ has to be manifest in us. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We pray, Lord, for this movement. We know that there are things that 
that we are responsible for, that I'm responsible for, that have hindered your work. We ask for forgiveness and that um, in spite of our sins, that Christ can be manifest. We pray that um, we can have the blessings of the Sabbath, that we can experience the joy of thy salvation. Be with us now for the rest of the evening and throughout the Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.